Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE, our program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise and it's exciting here at IBM Insight in the social lounge, uh, doing some social media, uh, creating some new relationships. Our next guest is Kirk Born, professor of astrophysics and computational science at George Mason University. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, John. Great to have you. One of the things we love about theCUBE is we are, we're like surgeons. We want to get the data out of your brain and share it with the world out there. <laughs> um, astrophysics, computational science. I mean, to me, the first thing that pops in my head is social data and cloud computing because the game's changed. I mean, I, I, mean, I want to get your perspective just at a very high level to kick this things off. Having computation on demand is a wonderful thing. And then you got this whole metaphor of Internet of Things and data is flying everywhere, unstructured. It's kind of like a star cluster. You know, the Milky Way out there <laughs> is somewhere out there. What's the gravity of all this data? I, I love your metaphors there. <laughs> <laughs> I know we have astronomical growth in data, so I uh, got hooked into this uh, very early on because of this, this, the growth in truly astronomical data that I was working with at NASA for many years. Like, I mean, for the first time, in, really think about that. The first, first time in modern business ever, you can measure everything. Correct. So there's no excuses, so you need the computation. How should a manager think about how to approach their future infrastructure, their future app development, their future engagement, if you will? What's the mindset? How should they approach it? It's not your grandfather's data warehousing or any other process. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think historically we, uh, we think about moving the data to a centralized location, you know, putting all the data in one place and have that one unified data model and that one view of the data. Um, but with the, the, the world as it is now, uh, with, with data in so many places, in so many formats, and in such volume, that we really have to move the computation to the data, move the algorithm to the data. I think, that, and I think that's the new paradigm for infrastructure, is how do you make uh, the, the, the analyst's job easier? Uh, and I think trying to have that analyst, or require that analyst to pull all data from all sources and do all this munging and wrangling before they can start, isn't going to work. You have to basically, Look at the workflow as a computational workflow that's moving to data sources. We had, we had Bill Inman on at MIT, father of the data warehouse, right? And, and he was um, really uh, encouragingly open to new models. You know, one would think maybe, well, he's hanging on, but he's not at all. Um, and he, he basically said, look, you, you need to include these into your new world, and as you say, bring the, the code to the data, not the data to the code. Um, and, and in the surveys that, that we do, we find that Two of the major initiatives that people have are tool sets that they bring to their big data initiatives are data integration tools and, and the existing data warehouse. So help us square that circle. Um, is that sort of the model that, that you see? And how does the sort of old and the new fit together? Well, I have this, uh, th this, this uh, idea in my head of a trilogy called The Lord of the Things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the chapters. I want to see the main characters of this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who, well, one, one of the chapters of the trilogy is, uh, is the twin powers <laughs> of data. <laughs> twin powers. And the twin so powers are both, uh, in, in the language you're using, uh, warehouse, the data warehouse and also the real-time operational data flow. And so when I say bring the, uh, empower the analyst to move the computation to the data, I'm thinking a lot more about, the, well not a lot more, I'm thinking in some sense about the real-time data stream. So the, the analysts can't like pull the, the real-time data stream onto their desktop, they have to let the data stream flow where it goes and, move, and they move the algorithm there. But in an operational environment uh, where you have already designed the workflow and designed the uh, sort of the, um, the, the sentinels, I call it, the, the, the algorithms that are going to identify customer events or, or real-time events. You know, that can operate in a structured data environment like a data warehouse. So the data warehouse, remember, as it, as it always has been, is that place where you have that well-defined data model, that well-defined set of data that enables your business decision-making. And once you've, the analyst has sort of discovered sort of the, the paths to insight, then they can encode that in uh, an algorithmic stream with these, these sentinels in the data side. So I always talk about with data, we're going from sensors to sentinels to sense. Okay, so we have the sensors collecting the data, 
these sentinels, these algorithms, identify when something great happens and then we may try to make sense of it. So as a practitioner, what does that mean for how you apply resources to sort of the, in my language, the traditional data warehouse and, and sort of the, the new? Are you sort of baselining your spend in the, the, the data warehouse and spending more? Uh, 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 actually, or are you, maybe for a dollar that you might spend here, you only have to spend 30 cents uh, on the new stuff, and, and, but yet the volume is so much higher, as we were talking about before you came on. How do you see that shaking out? Well, uh, I, I, I'm not going to begin to pretend to tell a business how to uh, as, as, you know, appropriate their, their dollar that they have to spend on this, uh, but they're going to have to look at uh, what really where they derive value, innovation, and, and uh, re return on investment, or as I like to say, return on innovation. And if it's more on one side of that house, that, that is the real-time stream versus the, uh, the, the, the warehouse operational environment, so be it. I mean, they, they, that has to be decided in each, in each case. Uh, and an example I, I heard of just recently, a very major uh, Fortune 100 company, which I won't name right here, right now, but, uh, but their, their, their business uh, is, is something completely not data when you think about their business. I mean, they, they're dealing with customers and, and you think about that you know, face-to-face -face customer engagement, that's what they're about. And yet, when you talk to them, they say, we're no longer that kind of a company, we're a big data company. So they're a big data company that, that, that owns property, is basically what they said. And the properties are where they engage face-to-face -face with customers. But, and so you think about that, said the, the company's redefining itself as a big data company. So, so they're actually making the decision that they're probably putting more investment into this. So it's no longer like, how do I appropriate this dollar? I now have two dollars, right, when I used to have one, because from the uh, senior executive yeah. management all the way down through the, the C-suite, corporate suite, uh, people have bought into the fact that, that data is their future. Yeah, well, and, and, and a lot of people tell us they're, the best way to get an ROI is to, to lower the denominator. And so <laughs> they talk about reduction on investment. And, and I guess to follow up, do you see people, do you see that? And do you also see an accelerated investment in the new stuff? Well, I think the, I think, uh, the accelerated investment will, will return even more. I mean, so you're right. You're, uh, two, two ways to achieve that is make the denominator smaller, than the, or, but you make the denominator so small uh, that, your, that your return, you, know, you invest a penny and you get two pennies back, well that's really not going to you know, look good on Wall Street. Uh, but I think now the, um, uh, this, this whole idea of lift uplift modeling, um, some businesses historically have said if we get like a 1% return on some kind of a, a campaign, that's great, that's fantastic news. Now, now I'm talking with, businesses are seeing 73%, in one case, 700% return on the investment. And so, why not invest, not one dollar in the denominator, on but, a large but, base, but, too, but to two, point. Yeah, a, a yeah. much bigger base, mm. because now you're talking about an explosive growth yeah. from that type of Kirk, investment. I want to get your thoughts on, on, I was having a chat here last night at the reception here at the social lounge uh, with uh, another PhD uh, professor in, from Turkey, and we were talking about some papers he wrote two years ago, and they're popular now. So, I want to get your perspective on a couple things. One is, um, this lag effect on the academic side where there's some really good body of work done just a few years ago um, that are, and, and maybe go back even a decade, network theory, by the way, signal theory always is translating well into this computational kind of graph space, if you will, around these new databases. What historically, what old to recent, is really working from a paradigm standpoint that's kind of mainstream right now? And what are some key things that you see happening right now in the, in the business tech theater that are super exciting that people should focus in on? Well, I think the, uh, the lag is, is really a significant uh, thing to think about, as you're saying. Uh, I, I got uh, first very interested in this field uh, primarily through uh, data mining as a, an application of machine learning algorithms to large data sets in astronomy over 15 years ago. And as I look, I started going to some conferences on data mining and machine learning just to learn more about it. And, and, and these, these conferences had hundreds, if not tens of you know, hundreds of talks uh, at each of these conferences on new algorithms, and, and it's like, this was you know, 15 years ago, and those are all published algorithms, and there's a dozen such conferences a year, and if you, if you multiply by 10, 20 years, you're talking about a lot of stuff that's in the, astro the uh, an astronomical amount of stuff in the research literature. But ha has, has much of that seen the light of day? I don't know. What's um, happening now that you're seeing that's super exciting? So, so, so I'm seeing, I, what I see what's happening is, is the, the real powerful algorithms uh, that have sort of gotten legs, so to speak, are, are now uh, being adopted uh, in, in very you know, small and mid-sized companies that before it would only a larger company would maybe you know, take the risk of investing there. 
So, so one of the areas, of course, is machine learning, uh, which grew out of uh, the, uh, the artificial intelligence world. And I always tell my students <laughs> that uh, machine learning is just a set of algorithms. If you apply machine learning to, to data, it's called data mining. If you apply it to to, to machines, it's called robotics. I mean, it's, just, it's the same set of algorithms. It's the brains underneath and, the application, and right? And if you apply it to business decisions, it's called uh, operational analytics, or opera <laughs> operations research. And so, uh, so operations research is a really great area of where uh, convex optimization, which, I mean, huge numbers of uh, books and, uh, and uh, a large, uh, I keep saying astronomical, but astronomically <laughs> large uh, collection of, um, of research uh, in that mathematical field is now seeing the light of day because it fits, feel, yeah. Fuels right well, let's, into let's drill down on that because that's, that's prescriptive analytics, which is the, what the predictive the but thing. prescriptive kind of there's nuance there, right? So let's get to that in a second. But I want to double click on this uh, notion of machine learning, this fabric of machine learning, and how it powers applications. We love to talk to jo Jeff Jonas because all we do is get intoxicated by our, own, our 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 talks about this because it's really exciting. But the, but Dave and I have researched that most customers think they could they should build systems around their existing data space. Uh, not, you know, I call it data space, name space, but data sets. They know what they have, they build around that. Um, but now new data sets are coming in, so what's happening is they, this, they, they need to build an infrastructure every time the new data set comes in, so they got to be agile. Uh, also, I want to bring in a, a comment in he Chusa mentioned at the TED at IBM event in San Francisco last month, which was, she kind of talked about this notion, she didn't really tease it out, it might have been premature, active data. How is active data, because whether it's robotics, operational analytics, or whatever application machine learning's in, you got to be looking at a space that you're observing, to use Jeff Jonas's word, that observation space. That's a key active piece that could feed the machines to learn, right? right. So you're only as good as what you read or learn, right? If you're right. a learning algorithm. So how does that all play out? Are you seeing changes in that specific uh, area with regard to data, what kinds of data? Well, I think the, what I see is just the diversification of the data sources more than anything. I mean, I mean, a lot of times you talk to people said, you know, businesses will say we've always done big data, and I, 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 I sort of react negatively to that kind mm. of comment. But what, but I understand what they're saying is that they've always been a data-driven business. But 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 maybe it was just one kind of data. I mean, it might have been just like the, the quarterly sales data. Okay, that <laughs> okay. you know. And so we talk we talk about descriptive analytics, which is looking in the rearview mirror about what happened in the past. And so, uh, the predictive analytics, which is which is one of the hottest things in, in this field now, about you know, you know predicting from what happened in the past as to uh, what will happen. But then we, from there, you move you can move to prescriptive analytics, where you say, well, given all the possibilities of what could happen, what's the, what's the what's the most optimal thing that could happen, and how can I influence to make that happen based upon what I've seen happening in the past? But the the, the leap forward beyond that now is cognitive analytics, and that's where people are looking at the full set of data. The, and so that's what I mean by the diversification of data. We're not just looking at quarterly reports, we're looking at you know, social media, voice of the customer, and all kinds of things like that. What role do you see humans playing in all this? Because as you go from descriptive to predictive to cognitive, it gets more complex uh, and faster. How, what's the role of humans? You know, the, the old bromide, humans are the last mile. Is it yeah. true? Are humans becoming less important, more important? What, what's your perspective on well, that? Well, I'm glad you brought up that last mile statement because I always say the last mile challenge, well, the first mile challenge in, in, in big data is integrating all these diverse data sources I mentioned. Uh, the last mile challenge is to, to derive actionable insight from it. That, that is the human in the loop, actually being able to take some kind of an action based upon that stream. And that is really a big challenge. And so I, I see, uh, a lot of ways I see humans in the loop there. One, of course, is, is just the one that, that vets the final decision, right? Because if you, if, if you, if you end up with sort of a, a list of, of, of possible actions to take, someone has to make the decision. And if you, an algorithm shoots out you know, a list of 10 things with the probability that they'll all have some kind of success, and if the difference between the probabilities is, is microscopic, you can still create the ranked order list, but, the, but there's really no fundamental difference in, the, in those, so a human has to look at that. Uh, uh, so I'm afraid of, of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah. Uh, what do you see and what do you advise for organizations? Well, I, I, I have, uh, this, I'm not sure how this will work out, but I have this idea of breadcrumbs, which other people have talked about, which is you see how people use the data, you see how people access the data, you see what kind of pieces of data lead to in, uh, good insights and good decisions, and all, all through that process, through, all through that workflow, there's like tags, you think about tag management systems and, and web analytics, there's tags that track the, your business users, your business analysts' use of data. And at the end of the day, you say, here's, here's the data stream and here's the workflow that really led to some really powerful outcome. So, so you can trace back how that happened and try to formalize that within a business. 
Right. And that can be automated, presumably. Right. And you say, okay, here, here's where you're spending your time. Is that really where you want right. to be spending your time to optimize so, so your in this, business? So in this field, there's a lot of, in this field, there should be, I, in my, my personal opinion, there's got to be a lot of fast fail. That is, you try a lot of things and try to find the one that works best. Don't build something out, spend two years building and discover that it doesn't work. Do a lot of fast fail, and then at, at the end of that stream, you say, here, here, are the, here are the paths through our data that led to success, and that's, that's forced. Uh, ourselves to follow those. Well, Kirk, to your point about uh, we're data driven, and I know what you mean by that, because everybody says, oh, we've always been data driven, but are, are they really? I feel like it's more than just data. It's, it's processes, it's mindset. You mentioned fast, fast fail. It's willingness to, to try different things. It's maybe how you approach infrastructure, your whole vertical stack within your industry. What are the other sort of components beyond data that you see as success you know, instruments that people can, or levers that people can turn, knobs? Well, some of that's, I would say, some of that soft stuff, and that is culture, business culture. I mean, people always talk about culture, each you know, strategy for lunch or something like that, and, yeah. and, and, uh, or for breakfast, or whichever one, <laughs> whichever that metaphor is. Uh, and I firmly believe that, because I've been, I've been in places, and I won't name anything, but I've, I've had a number of places I've worked at over my career, and, uh, and there are places who are very open to change and, and, and innovation, other places haven't been. And so, you, you need to have that, that corporate culture that, yeah, when you, as you say, data-driven is not just about the data, it's, it's about, the decision, the mindset that we're going to use uh, evidence-based decision-making in our business. And so, and, so, and so creating data products and an environment where that works for people is, is really you know, sort of fundamental to me. And those data products you know, might be not just your morning daily report, but it might actually be almost like a, a visualization of the hot spots of your, of your business as, as determined by the data. And storytelling seems to be a big part that we see with Tableau, for instance, the creative side of the use of the data, not only at the app developer piece, which is give, giving the app developer frontline access, because now they're closer to the outcome, so that's one, and then the business units are. But we have a uh, question from the crowd here. Question for Kirk. Um, how are regular business line people, not PhDs, going to understand the astronomical quantities of data? Seems hard for the average Joe line guy making daily decisions, human factors. Well, that's uh, one of the big areas of research, I would have to say, is the human factors research to make this work. And, uh, and you mentioned Tableau already, there, there are companies out there like that who are, are bringing sort of the storytelling of the data uh, to, you know, to, to the user who's not going to be in, enmeshed in you know, mathematical algorithms on their day-to-day -day basis. They, they, they want to be able to see what's happening and, t and be able to tell the story of what's happening and, and having t tools in their hands uh, that are more semantically oriented. And, and by semantically oriented, I mean uh, the way the data are displayed and presented is in the context of their business. So it, 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 has, it has all the contextual richness uh, that a person needs to make a decision. And so that's what I think about cognitive analytics is cognitive stuff in humanity is like when you make the decision based upon your entire context, right? I know the right thing to do because I see the surround, my environment around me and I know to go through that door and not that door or something like that. And, and, and the same should be happening in, in the sort of the analytics space that helps people who use their, just their natural inability to, to, to identify a pattern or a trend and, and yeah, that's the one that is signaling you know, a decision for me and, and make that as, 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 as human friendly as possible. Have you seen advances in the academic side with research and also some of the students around the creativity? Because this is something we always try to tease out because that's something that's not well reported out there, but we see it and we've been talking about it is there's an almost a new level of creativity because like I said, everyone's connected now and the, the researchers love data. They're usually data geeks, right? So they love to chump, munge the data or <laughs> wrangle the data, eat the data, play with the data, party with the data. Has that exploded on the creativity side? So has, has it enabled new lines of thinking? Can you share any examples? Well, I, I just, you just named everything that I, I live for. <laughs> 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 I mean, so uh, storytelling story with data, the, the creativity and curiosity aspect is what drives me and gets me up every morning. Uh, but for me, how I see that in my own immediate work environment is, is uh, you, look at, you, you named uh, my title at the university, Professor of Astrophysics and Computational Science, but what I do is I teach data science even though my background are those things. And among these data science students, I have students who are doing medical research, who are doing financial research, you know, people who are uh, a analyzing uh, text, text records of, of near misses of aircraft uh, in, in the air, national airspace. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, people who are doing time series analysis, uh, all kinds of things that are happening and in fields that I personally know little about, but, but I can 
communicate with my students through what I call transdisciplinary data science. It transcends discipline boundaries. So all of a sudden people are having all these creative ideas and you're not sort of stuck in your own little box trying to find someone to talk to about your idea. You can now talk with people who use this common language of data science and that, that actually triggers even more creativity because now you hear someone else's perspective who's outside of your field but you're still able to communicate in this common data science language. Can, I, can you share, because uh, this is so cutting edge, I mean, it's really awesome, and I have a daughter who's going to college, my son's in college, and, and I try not to get them too focused on putting a stake in the ground in terms of career, but I got to get your perspective. Let's just say that uh, Dave, myself, and you are draft picking <laughs> data scientists. We're, like, we're the general manager of the team, and we want to identify some, identify some great host prospects. What makes that tech athlete? Um, is there general, I, mean, I don't want you to be too pigeonholing in terms of specifics, but if we were like evaluating the candidates in a combine workout, students if you will, what makes the killer data scientist? I mean, there are different roles, I understand that, but like, if we were like sitting here and draft picking, what would we look for? Well, it's really funny you should say that because uh, uh, I follow my own collegiate <laughs> football team very closely and they, and they had a really super athletic, uh, I won't name this, but people can figure this out. And they had a really super athletic quarterback. I mean, came out of high school just really highly touted. And yet, the guy really made poor decisions on the field and it was really sort of a disaster. And so, so if you just sort of look at sort of, uh, sort of some measurable attributes, I mean, sort of the more objective ones, sometimes those don't work so well. But it, what really matters is, that, is the, the ability, and now going back to the data science, uh, the, the ability to problem solve, uh, to have th that insatiable curiosity to find out what the what it's, you know what is the answer to this question you know being even able to an ask good questions and also the communication skills I always talk about the three C's of data scientists as the as the three things I look for communication creativity and curiosity and if you don't have those three then you're already batting you know down Zero, in, in yeah. the order so to speak and uh, and I always. Like in my classes at university, people ask me, oh, do you teach Hadoop, do you teach Java, do you teach this and that? And I say, I don't teach any programming language in my courses at all. Well, except in the freshman course, I, we teach MATLAB just to get students familiar with it. But, uh, but I teach the concepts, I teach the algorithms, I teach the, the underlying uh, techniques and methods and, and decision making. Do, why, do I why do I choose this algorithm? What are the different data types? I have numeric data, I have unstructured data. What algorithm works best with this? And now, programming languages come and go, programming environments come and go. You know, if they're going to have a life in this field, they're going to have to know the, the concepts and, and how to do you know, good you know, problem solving and attacking a problem uh, conceptually as opposed to, oh, I, I can write a, a piece of code that will solve that problem, but not, not, but not really understand why they're trying to solve the problem. How to apply them is really what we're so, so I'm looking more for those, you know, uh, that sort of leadership on the field decision making, like that one particular quarterback I mentioned was lacking as opposed to the, the fact that the guy was probably the most athletic quarterback in the country, yeah. but it didn't work out too well. So <laughs> we got a break here, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, poor decision making. Tom Brady's got the X factor, Joe Montana, we all know. Exactly, you know, you know those Colin people. Kaepernick yeah. was not well touted at Niners, and he's just got the X factor, make, can make things happen yeah, there you go. on the run. So I got to ask you a final question here. Obviously, you know, we always, Dave and I always joke about, you know, influencer, because <laughs> it's something that we play with a lot of data, social data, and a lot of people in the social digital world are saying, oh, he's influential. No, but he's just the loudest. The Milky Way is gravity, where star clusters can form, stars come and go, but there's always a core inner circle. Have you done anything around, or have any thoughts on what is influence mean? And obviously long tail distribution has different targeted and different communities. And it seems to, the same metaphor seems to apply. Network theory, distributed networks, astrophysics, kind of apply to interactions. What's your right. thoughts on influence? Well, I guess influence is, I, I, that's a good question. I'm not really sure I thought too deeply about it. Um, for me, influence uh, comes first from the, the, the personal passion of the individual. Uh, if you feel passionate about what you're talking about, people around you will feel that passion and will gather around you. That maybe that's the gravity. Uh, I mean, you know, so there's been some discussion in recent years about who's the, you know the top big data influencers on Twitter, and I've been in that conversation. <laughs> and it's not the people with the most followers, okay? And uh, that sort of surprises some people because they they work really hard to get a lot of followers, and then they're not in the, in that conversation of top influencers. And and, and, I, and I think it comes right down to passion. I mean, I, I always tell people the, the, the biggest and best compliment you can ever pay to me is, is, is when people say that I'm an enthusiastic person. Because yeah, that, that's how I feel. And if you notice that about me, yeah. you, know, I, I've, I've, you know, I've made an impact there. I've, I've influenced you in some way that maybe you're going to listen to me or pay attention to me. So, so that influence 
you know, comes from people of passion. And, you know, we've seen some people like that at this uh, IBM Insights uh, already this week. I mean, some of the speakers uh, like Jeff Jonas and folks like that, you and Jake Corway, I mean, you just like, you're, you see the passion in them and you just want to follow them and be influenced by them. And it's that and, semantic and the alignment you're mentioning, the con contextual, so it's really back to the old, you know, internet stuff, you know, behavioral and contextual data, right? Yeah, well, well, of course, uh, PageRank. PageRank for people. If you think about PageRank, it's not just how many links you have going out or how many coming in, it's how many, how many other high-ranked things point to you and vice versa, right? And so when you're interacting in, uh, among a set of peers who, who are like, likewise-minded, I mean, then that just sort of be, uh, spreads and that becomes your center of gravity of that Milky Way of data science. Well, we <laughs> consider you a very influential person. You've got great subject matter expertise. You do some great work. Uh, links for people to find you, collaborate with you, have crowd chats with you. What can you share for contact information? Uh, well, uh, my Twitter feed is my, my life right now. <laughs> uh, I just tweeted uh, yesterday when I arrived in Vegas that uh, what happens in Vegas stays in my Twitter timeline. So uh, you, can, you can find out about what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of blogging on a, different, on a lot of different sites, uh, but just in the last week I decided, hey, I need, I need to have my own center of focus there. And so you can go to rocketdatascience.org and it's, uh, there's not much there yet, but uh, maybe only five or six blogs, but uh, that's, that's after only been in, being in existence for well, four days. <laughs> let us know how we can help. We certainly <laughs> want to promote your, uh, your mojo because you've got great work going on. And again, the gravity is everything. You can create a little cluster, get some collaboration going, good ideas will spread. And again, it's all about the collaboration, uh, virtually and physically. So appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Well, well, thanks so much. Uh, this is theCUBE. We're here live in Las Vegas. Uh, this is the Social Lounge special presentation from theCUBE, SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's uh, presentation. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break.